Great. Great. Thank you. And uh, nice to be with you, even if it's in the middle of the night here in Sweden. So uh, next, please. Yeah, sorry for the very long title on this. I think uh, it's all about quality it should have been a shorter and uh, more on the spot title. But and uh, also um, great thanks to uh, my colleagues that also on our had been helping we, me with this and are a part of the team working with this. So next, please. Uh, I can't really pass this that we had a, quite a bit of celebration one month ago in Sweden when our um, reporting system, uh, Art Portal and the Swedish Species Observation System, pass 10 million observations. And uh, that I think is quite impressive for a NGO driven reporting system. So um, next please. And uh, this is what I mainly will talk about, this data flows of observation uh, with um, focus on um, the invasive alien species uh, as the key factor in what we have built the last uh, two, three years. And uh, one of the key factors that we have in Sweden is uh, our taxonomic database, Dune Taxa, that is um, concept based and everybody dealing with biodiversity is using uh, that um, backbone in Sweden today. So we had very little problem with, um, um, so say, the synonymy and different um, taxas. So, um, so that's a big luck for us that we, we can, we have or forced perhaps uh, everybody to use it or not we the nature conservation agency really forced that everybody dealing with monitoring and um, and management should use the same taxonomic uh, backbone uh, next please uh, we can start with uh, the reporting system as uh, i just said we have this um, uh, art um uh, that is our main system and since uh, four years we also have um, a special way into this uh, database for um, people that not have accounts uh, for especially the invasive alien species um, according to um, the European Union legislation. Uh, next please. Uh, one of the key factors is, of course, the quality of uh, observations. And I will come back to that part soon. So um, next, please. Uh, we also have an alert services or a subscription services. Uh, I will probably is more correct um, there especially the um, the counties, the 21 counties that is responsible for the work with invasive alien species in Sweden can subscribe uh, for reports on species. And it's also a possibility or a demand for those pe persons working with um, um, verification of observations that have this subscription. So they get an alert by email when they're coming a, a new observation that should be verified or uh, for the counties, there is a verified observation that they should take care of. Next, please. After uh, the observations is verified, it goes over to the county administration system uh, who is responsible for the eradication and management of um, invasive species. And uh, there they have a loop 
uh, on the eradication and following up and uh, um, back again if because for many species especially the plants it takes some years to get rid of of a population but then that it's fixed it goes back to uh, the species information systems and uh, art portalen next please and uh, you get the visualization on uh, what sites there are the species has been eradicated, those with an X on uh, that map. Next, please. And uh, after that, the observations go further for research or for reporting to your European Union or nationally. And uh, it's also an um, regular update to GBIF uh, of um, all, all our observations. Uh, next, please. Um, but uh, as we see, the critical part in this is how to get the best possible quality. So far, um, some of the success factors behind uh, our system is that is it is NGO driven. Uh, more than 95% of the observations in Art Portalen is from um, the NGOs and from amateurs and citizen science. And uh, another thing is the transparency that everyone with an account can make comments on observations and on photos. So we had an in initially quality assurance um, there that take care of very many of say, the wrong reports. And then we also to some extent have um, um, species identification, identification by image recognition, 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 but that is also a little bit of a shaky thing because some of these um, apps has started crappy, get better and better, and then has declined a bit again, because it's very important that the image database behind is as accurate as possible. And sooner or later, it looks like some um, misidentifications are going into that um, backbones and make the results a little bit more fuzzier. So just um, um, a little bit of highlight on, on that. Uh, another success factor has been, um, uh, for Sweden at least, the Facebook communities for determination. There we more or less has groups for nearly all type of organisms. Even the most um, strange vertebrate groups had a community for determination that is very active and also very accurate. Next, please. And we are just um, launching um, the second generation of um, quality assurance and verification system in Sweden. And as many as, all, as earlier also have raised, uh, the main focus has been on the taxonomy and that is the right species we are dealing with. But it has been more and more important that is also the right position, especially when we're coming to invasive alien species that has a legal part and uh, also that it's, um, it's an economic part. It's, it's if you should go out for an eradication, it's, it's very important that it's really the right species and the right place that you are dealing with. Otherwise, you, you spend your, your money on, on nothing. So, so um, the new thing we have made for uh, this upgraded verification system is that we have a separate um, quality assurance on 
the geography, where the place is. Uh, next, please. And um, one help we have there is to see if is there nearby observations on that species. And um, in this case, you see the, the blue dot in the middle is the report and there are one black dot just upon that. So it is uh, already reported from um, that, that place. So it's probably um, the right spot. Uh, so that is one, one of the new inventions we had made for fasten up the quality insurance. Next, please. And we also have a feedback loop to uh, the persons that have report uh, the observation, uh, both for those who are in, is in, this, in the art portfolio system that has an account, of course, but also for those who report um, without an, an account that we can get in contact with them to, to get more information. Next, please. And um, of course, we are not in, in a perfect uh, world, but um, uh, we had a rather okay system now to handle what's reported in our own system. But uh, one future challenge is how to improve quality in external data sources. Um, for instance, the iNaturalist and uh, uh, all the other national systems and international systems that uh, has relevant information, um, how to make a good feedback loop to improve the quality in those data and how to get rid of say, wrong or say, bad re reports. And um, one other ch challenge is um, the position failure that uh, has been more and more accurate in um, the cell phones, both Android and iPhone has not um, done a good job the last years for uh, the position. So it's uh, so that the cell phone has now and then very bad say, information on where it is. We had positions that had, had been 10 or 15 kilometers wrong because um, of inaccurate uh, positions from uh, the mobile phones. And also how could we um, made an optimal use of artificial intelligence to improve and the quality checks and get down the costs. And of course, all systems need financing and this is always a lack of money. So how to make quality more sexy so we get um, more possible financing for um, those people that we have to do the let's say final checks and set the stamp on uh, the observations that it's really is the right species and the right positions. Next, please. Yeah, and thank you very much for uh, your attention and um, looking forward to some feedback and questions. Uh, Leanne, do you have to come up for general Q and A? <laughs> so, any questions? So we do have one online that's come through. Um, it's for me. Uh, 
do you do anything to alert or raise awareness of invasive species alerts among citizen science uh, scientists as well? Um, so currently, we don't do anything specifically to um, alert users that their data might go through to be biosecurity alerts. Um, I think we are just in a cut, what is it, a month or so, there's a citizen science conference that's coming up that Erin's presenting the alert data in. And I think that'll start to open up that discussion a bit more about is there more we should be doing around this and letting them know what's actually happening with their data. I will, thanks for your presentation. <laughs> Um, I was just curious, you said that you had a five-year um, reporting window for sending an alert observation. And I was wondering why you picked five years, because it's something we've been grappling with at the Atlas around what that ideal interval should be. Um, because a lot of the um, agencies that they w work with, um, they want sort of just more current current records. That is a um, good question. Uh, I don't think I know the, the actual answer to it, but my wild guess is that it was a combination of what someone at the Environment Institute, um, the Natural Resources Institute, uh, picked off the top of their head and that was feasible for us um, and that we thought would be relevant, yeah, I guess. Um, mine's a bit of an open question, I think, to all the speakers. I'd like to know a bit more about the sort of what happens next, that chain on to kind of people who then enact um, uh, you know, and respond to these alerts. So how, how does that work in your respective countries? And are there ways that you think you might improve that or be more involved in that process? So do you mean by responding to the alerts? Yeah, so you see it found an invasive species. So what? What happens? What, what, what's the action that then needs to be triggered as a result of that? And yeah, then... so, so for the system that we developed, uh, once so the, the um, alerts mainly go to the field managers and the institutes. So from the moment they get an alert, it gets evaluated and then they can actually see see the record, of course, where the species was and which species it's it's it concerned, and based on which species. And uh, there's also like um, there are areas defined with a high priority and low priority, and species group with with the same priority, so low and high priority, depending on which species it is and which area it is, it gets uh, eradicated immediately or or, or uh, be ca taken care of. If it's a low priority species in a low priority area, then it's more like uh, if 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 they find the time, they they do something about it. But it's not always the case. And does that get communicated back to the person who sort of put the alert in, or is there no. a chain? No, at this point it doesn't know. Um, but yeah, the idea is also to get the management data to GBIF, but then, uh, like I mentioned in my presentation, we need to get it uh, in the right format. Uh, so yeah, it's it, there's no turning back yet, no. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, I can just give, give a short answer on uh, that from the Swedish point of view as, we have this subscription uh, system, so um, there are for, yeah, about the same as you men mentioned here now, that uh, it depends on the species, of course. If it's Japanese knotweed, um, there is perhaps could be hundreds of notifications uh, per day uh, in the field season, so, uh, but other, other species are more say, important and, uh, in a more hurry to um, take care of. And uh, as I also presented, we have this loop back. So uh, it's get into the system that um, populations is eradicated, uh, but we had no um, 
feedback directly to um, the person that sent in the report because in some cases this could take five or ten years before before the population is finally eradicated and uh, um, that is a little bit I think um, technically overkill to try to make but the observation the, the feedback is there in the system so if you want it you can find it so just from the australian's perspective our our alerts um because they're just aggregated alerts most of them are coming through iNaturalist um, so when we have had detections of interest to biosecurity, we've been encouraging the relevant biosecurity agencies to log into iNaturalist and interact with that person directly. Um, if they're coming through other data providers, if it doesn't have that interaction built into the app, um, we've just been providing an intermediary say, yeah, we're happy to try and connect you up with that user and ask if we need to ask permission to say, get their email address and share it back with the biosecurity departments. But by and large, we sort of, we're sort of hands off. We just sort of facilitate um, that connection um, there. And then regarding an actual like response, I think the first thing is that a a record in iNaturalist does not by default trigger a response. They say that that's just an indication that something might be there. Um, so they'll go and look at that actual report and then um, they are really looking for an actual sample. So if it is something of interest, they'll send a team out actually looking to do some trapping and try and collect a sample to have a confirmed detection of a pest. And if that's confirmed, then it starts to trigger different agreements that are already in the Australian biosecurity system. Hi, Justin Billing, the Environmental Biosecurity Office in Agriculture Department. Um, we deal with both incursions and established, so exotic and established species. I love all the alerts that you all talked about. Are your alerts primarily focused at new exotic incursions to the country or does it also include movement of established species to new areas within the country. Um, in in Finland, it's um, primarily new invasives and not established ones. I mean, it's a rel it's a big European country, but a relatively small country compared to Australia, so. Um, once something's in, it's in. Um, uh, for plant pests and diseases, I think there's more um, concern about stuff that's already in some parts of the country, but it um, may get to other places where it's more of an economic concern. Um, but yeah, from our point of view, it's mainly stuff that's coming from the south. And in, in a place like Finland, changes due to climate change are a big worry right now about stuff that's been in Southern Europe for a long time um, and is now just starting to, to appear and we're seeing increasingly things like that happening. That's a major concern. Um, so in Belgium, we work with two lists. We have a uh, target list and an alert list. So um, the one list uh, focuses on species that are already there and uh, how we can manage them based on the alerts we get. And another one is, is the list of species that through horizon scanning have been identified as a potential danger uh, or hazard. Um, and these is the, these get a different approach a bit. So uh, we so to be short, we work with both so species that have been already in Belgium and species that are a threat from the outside. Yeah, I can just uh, make also a short statement there that um, as Finland, we we are we are a long country from south to north. So um, species that are established in the southern part of Sweden um, is slowly moving or fast even uh, moving north uh, today. So it's um, so, so it's of course uh, more 
important to have uh, alerts um, in the northern part for species that are just on their way to, to stop them. But uh, as we have this subscription system, so it could also, you have to the possibility not only to, on a certain species, you can also have it for just your county or your part of Sweden. So, so that's, that's also a possibility to not give alerts for the, the whole of the country and just in the, the parts you are interested in. Thank you for some talks. Um, so um, biosecurity and invasive species both have an economic dimension and um, those are um, threats to not only to biodiversity loss, but also the economic loss or the damage to the industry. Have you already worked with or, or uh, thinking about uh, working with uh, natural resources managers or the governments um, with the existing database and uh, so that the data could be useful to the uh, economists, for example? Um, so, so what we have for our project is that we developed some kind of a decision support tool. Um, so it relates to the high and low priority sites that I mentioned before. So the tool works with, uh, I'm not sure, I think about 10 or 15 questions based on these uh, biodiversity threats, but also on like uh, financial impact of the region. Uh, so, so I think that's our most close link with with not only like the diverse the biodiversity uh, aspect, but also the economic impact. It's kind of integrated in how we choose our areas of priority to manage. Um, just from the ALA perspective, um, we don't sort of do the decision report tools, but our data is open. Um, but we are a collaborator on uh, something called Biosecurity Commons, uh, which is essentially like a large online modelling platform where there's different models that um, governments or NRMs could use to model what the impact is. And our data is connected directly to that. So if you're using Biosecurity Commons, you have access to that data um, to use it. Okay. Um, question for William. Um, about the alert system in uh, Finland, you said that uh, you're also monitoring the neighboring countries was that part of the alert system too or uh, and uh, in case how, how do you <laughs> do that you said you had like 50 million uh, occurrences in your portal but uh, the alert system then uh, checks for <laughs> the neighboring countries too yeah um, we we do, I mean, our data that we get coming into FinBIF is primarily Finnish data, but we do have, like, we maintain our own um, citizen science portals and there's iNaturalist um, Suomi Finland, which they're in theory and, and hasn't been anything to stop a user of those services from doing, um, making reports from just across the border in, um, in Sweden, or if they've caught the ferry to Tallinn, they can make a report from Estonia. So we do get reports coming in, and we've in the past even had reports um, or, or, or observations, occurrence records from Russia. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think many of them have actually triggered alerts. Um, uh, it's a re it's a really coarse grained sense of neighbour, so it. In I was looking the other day, I did notice that we had a whole bunch of um, reports from uh, Russia on chipmunks, which apparently is an invasive species over there, a long way from the Finnish border, but they did, it did, it did look like they triggered some alerts because they were on our um, invasive species um, uh, alert list. 
so it's 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 more a theoretical exercise but it, it, it is possible that any given invasive species in one of the neighboring countries can enter our system and will trigger an alert yeah i can just give a give a short answer from from sweden on this too that we don't have, uh, as I say, cooperation on observation level, but we had a close cooperation both with Finland, Denmark, and uh, Norway on new species appearing. So we we work a little bit on that level, so we know what what could be a problem in Sweden soon. So um, yeah, thanks. Um, Cameron Sletcher from the Atlas of Living Australia, and I'm really hoping those chipmunks aren't um, singing chipmunks um, well, because that would be just awful. Um, question for, for all of the speakers, and four fantastic presentations and four fantastic projects, but also four separate systems for checking invasive species taxonomy for what is presumably a substantially overlapping list of, of invasive species. What, do you, what are your thoughts about trying to take a global approach so that uh, everybody's contributing to fixing the taxonomy for one list of evil mongrel bastards that are spreading over the planet. I find it a very difficult answer because I'm not a taxonomist, but how we deal with it, I might think that's an answer is that we publish our species list. So for each species we handle in the project, we have a well-defined list published to GBIF and we use the GBIF backbone uh, for all of our um, software tools we develop. So. My idea as a non-taxonomist would be go define your list as a separate data set on GBIF and work from that so everybody can compare their own list with the one you have and in that way make links. That would be my response. Um, yeah, I can say from the Swedish point of view, um, we mainly have have connections to global list as we have the q garden checklist for plants we have the algae base the worms and uh, so on so even if we in some cases has a little bit of different uh, taxonomy and uh, on some some parts uh, of all the biodiversity so we have a connection to the global global list so it's uh, i can't see a, a a big challenge to to work on a global global scale this one good um just to add to that Cam, I think you know about the grist list, <laughs> but uh, I think um, just to open up that conversation, we've had conversations within the ALA about the um, grist list, that it's really good that it exists, um, but at the moment there's no clear process on how uh, a community can contribute to that list and add to that list and correct it, change it as actually is needed. Um, I think the other challenge when we think about GBIF and any of the, the systems is that they're still not holistic and complete. Um, it doesn't have all the species, all the synonyms and that as well. So I think that's also a challenge um, when we think about this is what's, when there are existing tools, how can we use them? But how do we also address the things that are sitting outside of the current scope of those systems and how can we work through that? Um, as well. <clears throat> so actually, this is a subset of a really big problem that we've got. We often need lots of functional lists of taxa. They are relevant globally, and we can't share them. And actually thinking about how checklist bank, so GBIS checklist bank has evolved, 
maybe that when we normally use checklist bank as a repository of you know higher uh, you know authoritative groups uh, taxonomic groups that are contributing to the wider kind of global taxonomy we don't think of it in a functional sense but maybe actually an extension of checklist bank would be to think of it in that functional way and that way that would give that kind of global curation function that we need so whether it's invasives whether it's other taxa that are legislatively protected maybe it's species of conservation risk for example we could actually aggregate those let checklist bank and gbif mediate the complexities with the taxonomy and then that would actually allow us to sort of have a more integrated intelligent set of systems because we we tack you know we, we're troubled by this a lot in so many different areas and i think maybe you need to think about it in a new way so one suggestion for how we might do that Looks like we've got some questions. One from Alan here um, says there's a similar subscription based system for detecting invasive or problematic species in the online pet trade here in Australia, where this data is being constantly mined and agencies can subscribe to get notifications. Um, actually, not just pet trade, but online species trade. Um, that sort of brings to my mind the other challenge that I've been sort of thinking of is how we could get access to occurrences that are coming up in social media. We know that there's some very active groups, um, like in Australia, I know bees is a good example where lots of people take photos of bees, but they're not, you know, officially formatted in occurrences, but would still be really good to tap into that. So just wondering if anyone on the panel has actually delved into that at all and found anything that works or doesn't work? For our projects, we didn't consider that angle, so I cannot really respond to your question. Yeah, I guess our approach to that has been to try and avoid that problem by like mm -hmm. <laughs> encouraging the use of our established systems like um, our naturalist and our own, we have our own in-house um, both for invasives and a separate, just general citizen science reporting platform. Um, probably too many citizen science reporting platforms that we run, but we try to encourage use of those and um, I try and get more penetration that way. And that makes the problem easier to handle for us. I think it's been our approach, yeah. yeah as, as I mentioned already in my presentation, we had all these Facebook groups and we have se several on invasives also but that that mainly for learn learning reasons so um, that people get get to have to learn what is the right species and what it, what is what and then they are had reached a certain level uh, they are very often asked to start to report uh, in uh, our system so so that's uh, a bit of how social media is working in this sense. That is, it, that is some sort of uh, education system for, for people. So we've got about five minutes left. Um, and what Erin and I were actually hoping to get a little bit out of this session was that uh, where keen to find opportunities for collaboration around biosecurity and biodiversity infrastructure and what we can do um, more. So I think there's obviously been the discussion about checklist bank and invasive species. Um, does anyone have any other ideas or pressure points that you're struggling with that you think collaboration um, globally would help with? Um, yeah, I think in my presentation, I, I quite uh, <laughs> stressed the, the need for us for for uh, so the focus is a lot on occurrence data but to get the management data on GB would be like a great step because then you could have like this feedback loop where managers put in their data and people can exchange data so manager in one organization can see someone in another organization performing some actions because now this is a big 
big black hole for us. So, um, but for that we need to know, to capture as much as we can about how these data sets look like, or we forgetting some things, we, we want to focus on building perhaps new vocabularies. Um, but for us, that's, that's an important issue to get the whole loop um, closed. Yeah, I think that's, that's a little bit of the tricky thing there with different countries because every country has their own organization and how the top down or down top everything is organized so um, some some countries has much easier to to deal with this and uh, some has more more tricky situations so that's that i think is the real challenge just to come over the the differences between the countries in just how to make yeah. a system that works for everyone <laughs> yeah but i i do believe that there is like a core set of information that every country needs we all need to report on our methods on our materials that we use or working hours uh, so so there might be a large variation i i believe that but i do think we're all doing the same core things when we perform management so if we can find that, I think we're already one step further. I agree. Anything else? All right, I think we will call it then. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you.